everyone, and welcome to BrickCats. Today I'm reviewing the Mandalorian N1, designed by David Buchholz and distributed by BrickVault. As always, please consider leaving a like, subscribing to the channel, leaving a comment, participating in a community thread, or supporting what I do in any other way you see fit. I greatly appreciate it. I'm also excited to announce that BrickVault has generously given me a discount code to share, CATS15, and this gives you 15% off of a order of instructions with them. If you use my code, I do receive a small cut as well, which I'll use to offset some of the costs of making these reviews. BrickVault issued me the code without any requirements for positive coverage or a certain number of BrickVault reviews per year. So while there is a small amount of money involved, I'm not changing my process and will continue to give my honest opinion. Din Djarin's Mandalorian N1 features heavily in the early episodes of Season 3 and remains the only memorable thing to come out of the Book of Boba Fett. Without any substitutions for the ship and stand, Bricklink's algorithm gave me 6 stores and $99 without shipping and tax, or about $138 with shipping and tax. In my reviews, I offer my opinions on aesthetics and model features, parts issues you might want to look out for, the build experience, the model's integrity, and I close out with my overall impression and pricing information in the conclusion. If you're watching this review, I assume you bought the instructions or are interested in buying them. I also assume a basic level of familiarity with BrickLink's ordering system and LEGO nomenclature. I only use genuine LEGO bricks, and I always purchase the instructions. Lastly, I create these reviews for my own personal enjoyment, and in the hopes that my advice will make your experience more enjoyable and or less expensive. The Mandalorian N1 measures just about 12 inches long, 8 inches wide, and sits 5 inches tall on the stand, and about 2.75 inches off the stand. This size scales very well to a minifigure, and it's nearly identical to the model this is based on in Thirst Naboo N1. I built the Grogu compatible model, but there are instructions included for the variation that fits R5-D4. Starting right up front, these cannons look great, and they use the buildable figure lightsaber hilt for part of the barrel. There is just the slightest peak of the blue Technic pin used to hold the hilt. You can see it right there and on the other side. But these are replaceable if you have a gray pin or even a tan pin will work just fine. The wings have a nice shallow downward angle, as they should, a detail that I think is more or less mandatory for Mach M1s at this point. The contours of the forward fuselage are very nice and transition pretty well into the wing using these slope pieces, while the greebling on the top surface is highlighted with the minifigure shield with stud. And the darker strip right in front of the cockpit is included as well with these 1x1 dark bluish gray plates. The cockpit is the fairly standard 3 instrument panel and the Mandalorian or whatever other pilot fits very nicely. There are some studs to keep him or her in place. I think the sticker tile from the official set is actually one of the better stickers uh, available, and you could fit this in there without too much modification. It would look great. But I did substitute out the specified light bluish gray 1x1 round plates for these trans clear ones and added the uh, threat indicator in the lower right there just to give this model a little bit of color. On the port side of the fighter, the construction of this section is really cool, and this is actually a combination of stacked plates in the lower section here, and then the top of the black stripes are actually a tile at a right angle. I love the yellow running between the black stripes, but I do find these stripes to be a bit thick, and with black being such an aggressive color, in my opinion, it makes the two sides of the fighter feel maybe a little bit unbalanced. Uh, I totally acknowledge that it would be really difficult to cram these black stripes into a smaller space uh, and maintain this level of detail and as well as get the, the uh, sides of the fuselage here to match up with the cockpit. The gaps around the cockpit windscreen are pretty minimal and detailing to either side, um, I cover the port side, but on the starboard side uh, there is some asymmetry there as there should be. And I especially like the use of the hinge brick here um, with the different color top and the base to represent uh, kind of an exposed panel there. For Grogu's bubble, my absolute favorite part about this model is that the designer did not use the common 3x3 dome and went with a 2x2 dome. This did require some trade-offs in the shaping and color consistency of this section, uh, most notably or most obviously the black mudguard piece. 
Uh, these don't come in gray. They do come in tan, so I kind of wonder if that would be uh, less noticeable, but either way, that's fine in black here. And also these little sub-assemblies that um, provide the friction for the dome to stay somewhat in place um, are a little bit noticeable. And as a consequence of that, there are some gaps uh, from the front here. If you don't have Grogu in here, you could fill in these gaps with, I think, 1x3 tiles just on, on their sides and stuffed in there. Um, but it's not too bad overall, uh, but you can do that if you want. Um, overall, I think this is definitely worth the change. The 2x2 dome is uh, in much better proportion to the rest of the fighter than the 3x3. And in, turns, in turn, it means the rest of the rear fuselage can be narrowed accordingly. The hull tapers back very nicely into the tail section. The tail utilizes the new wedge piece, uh, and the section overall gives the idea of some exposed structure. But for an otherwise incredibly detailed model, I feel like this uh, tail is a bit lacking. It doesn't look bad by any means, um, I just don't feel like it looks that great, I don't know. The wedge piece at the end definitely has its merits, uh, specifically it tapers to a point, like no other LEGO piece does. Uh, but I still think it's too thick, and the angle isn't quite shallow enough to make this tail seem as long as it should, I think. On the underside of the model, there's definitely been an effort to smooth out the bottom of the hull, and I'm pretty okay with these gaps and exposed studs, as the model is already quite functional. The auxiliary engine is mounted in the proper place as well. And that tile that falls off all the time uh, it connects to this hollow stud, and there's only one stud, so that's why it's a little bit loose. I thought the engine connection was pretty neat, and I certainly was not expecting it at all. And instead of the more common stud connection with a bracket or something, or the Technic pin method, the designer has used these modified tiles, uh, and it's essentially two bar connections. So not only is this pretty easy to get on and off, um, it's also surprisingly stable. The engines are asymmetrical, with the starboard engine missing more of the paneling than the port side engine. And the intakes are constructed primarily out of slopes, and there is a minifigure, I'll turn this over, there is a minifigure fire mask poking out here for an additional bit of detail on the underside of the engine. The black dishes for the intakes look okay, and I'll explain why this little section of hose is sticking out a little bit later. The construction method for the engines utilizes the gaps in the Technic 8 tooth timing wheel, and I thought this was also a really clever way to do it, and it really lends itself well to uh, this application of creating kind of like a, an incomplete or exposed engine cowling. The dark red round brick inside gives each engine some cam and accurate color detailing, and these little pods on the underside are nice and close to the engine as they should be. I think these are a bit too large, um, I'm not really sure there's a better piece, maybe the candlestick, but with the candlestick the problem is um, it's pretty difficult to get those nestled up right close to the engine as they should be. The engines have a trans light blue dish on the back for some engine glow, and then the more or less standard method of the cone construction with the bar at the end to get this rear portion of the engines. The stand looks very good, it's also quite simple, and you can tell that there's some, even the stand is pretty fun to build. Uh, lots of side building there. It holds the fighter at a nice height. I do think that you could extend the hinge plates up, or at least one of the sides of the hinge plates, to maybe set this at more of an angle if you wanted to. Uh, but the stand is simple, functional, and um, definitely recommend it. This is a great looking model that is absolutely packed with details. It's unique and it's the only model I know of that uses the smaller dome at the top here. And with other sections like the engines, the designer has come up with very creative solutions. Brick Vault's Mandalorian M1 and the stand requires 181 elements and 666 pieces. The large figure weapon lightsaber hilt half 2L with axle hull part 21755 in flat silver tends to be fairly expensive at over a dollar each. You could try your luck with other colors like pearl dark gray or metallic silver, but you could also do a lot worse than substituting both for the very common Technic Axle Connector 2L in dark bluish gray, part 6538C. These elements are used for the little structures on the side of the engines, so if you want to do this, you'd change the quantity from 4 to 6. The black 14L hoses, part 75C14, as discussed later, could be very reasonably substituted for 13L hoses in black, part 75C13. Or you could buy a longer hose and cut it to the correct size. Black will definitely be safe, but a neutral color would also work. 
You're going to have the end of the hose visible in the front of the engine, but I think that's okay, as there is a little visible section inside each intake anyway. Uh, the one I have here, which is a good bet, is the 29L hose in flat silver. This is the one they use for the UCS Luke's land speeder, and this is currently available directly from LEGO. Uh, it's also reasonably priced on Bricklinked as well, uh, for about $2. The two Technic steering wheel small 3 studs diameter, part 2819, forms part of the engine towards the front. You can just see it right here. While this is reasonably common in light bluish gray, you may consider testing your results with light gray instead, as occasionally the light bluish gray wheels will be randomly expensive. Two of the four tile modified 1x1 one one with O clip, part 15712, and the tile modified 1x2 with bar handle, part 2432 in dark bluish gray form the connection point for this big wedge piece underneath here, and are completely hidden. These can be any color. The two slope 45 2x1 with two thirds cutout in dark bluish gray, part 92946, are also completely hidden, and these are right under here. And the following elements tend to be on the expensive side on Bricklink, just because they're new or in high demand or something. And you're going to get the most value by getting as much as you can from Pick a Brick, but at least consider buying the following elements directly from LEGO. This model requires 342 steps, and each part or subassembly you add in a given step is outlined in red against a white background. Each step has a reasonable number of pieces, and each page usually only has two steps, possibly with small subassemblies in a given step. The pace of the build is good, and in total it took me about 3 hours to complete. In certain steps, the computer-generated instructions have been supplemented with photos and specific locations to apply pressure to make certain connections, which was very useful, and I always appreciate that extra level of user-friendliness. And overall, I thought the build itself was very entertaining, up to the engines. And as I probably said before, there are a lot of very clever connections and interesting construction methods throughout. The engines, which are the last major section to be built, they do take a bit of patience, or at least they did for me. The bar with stud pieces that you're wedging into the gaps with the timing wheels, uh, they can generally slip forward or backward. It's not like a solid connection, they're a little bit loose. And the instructions do give you a warning about this, and some indeed do get held in place later on. However, since many of these are not connected solidly when you first put them in place, if you're kind of... Well, let me just take this off to show you... So while you're building this, if you're holding the engine subassembly uh, and angle your hand, like to get another piece on or to apply some pressure, um, it's very likely that those um, stud with bar pieces fall out of the gaps. So I f found myself kind of chasing these pieces all over my desk here. Uh, this is necessary. Uh, I mean, tilting it or rotating it is necessary due to the order of the build, uh, but you'll save yourself a lot of trouble if you can keep the engine assembly as level as possible. Certain other um, of those stub with bark pieces, they go for quite a long time without being connected to anything, and there are a number of rotations specified in the instructions that basically mean it's impossible to keep in place. And one example of this was the middle bar with stud piece in step 316. This is not connected again until step 331, and in between there's at least three required rotations of the engine assembly to get other parts or sub-assemblies connected. Luckily, this is on the uh, port side engine, which is the second one you build, so you're kind of wise to how those pieces behave by that point um, in this particular model. And back to those little sections of hose poking out. Uh, this is not a great example. I will give out the other side. So you can see that I have a fair bit of hose sticking out here. The hose length is specified as 14L, and I actually think this is the correct length. However, you need to push this hose really far back into the 2x2 cone at the back of the engine to minimize the amount of excess you'll have at the front. And this isn't explained in the instructions, and uh, to complicate things, there is a natural feeling stopping point when you put the hose in the cone to start with, uh, but I believe you basically need to um, put that hose as far back as you can so that you really see it matching up with the edge of the stud on the top of the cone here. Or you could just solve the problem by uh, using the 13L hose, and I think that will naturally eliminate uh, this excess here. 
And another problem with the specified hoses, and this is not the fault of the designer or brick fault or anything like that, um, I had a really difficult time getting some of these pieces in place. And this, partic this was particularly true with the dark red round bricks you see inside there. Um, the only way I actually got those on in the end was by running those pieces under hot water for like 30 seconds. And apparently that widened the hole just enough for me to get it on there. And since these go on in the later, those round bricks go on in the later stages of the engine, engine construction, it's a bit dicey trying to apply a lot of pressure. Like when you have, so basically you have this whole thing built and you're trying to shove that round brick onto the hose there. And so compressing this, this is not the most sturdy thing uh, at that point. So while you're really pressing hard, you kind of feel like this whole thing is just going to explode. Um, and on closer investigation, I noticed some issues with the ends of the hoses I had. You can barely see the smallest of imperfections right near the end in this picture, and this was on both of mine, uh, both ends of both of my hoses. And I took a look at some of my other hoses, and they don't have anything like this. Like, this hose is, like, perfectly clean at the end. And so maybe this is a manufacturing issue, or maybe I just got unlucky. And I actually did look at all of the black hoses I have in my spares bin, and most of them had it. So I think this is an issue specifically with the black hoses. Very interesting. The stand instructions are in a separate file, and I did not have any issues building the stand. It's the same one as the Naboo M1, so, uh, like I said earlier, so having a separate parts list and instruction set is nice if you don't want to build it. Uh, but if you don't have it, I def definitely recommend it. It's very stable, these hinge pieces are great. Um, you, well, I guess I'll show this now, but you can even hold this upside down. This model is reasonably sturdy, and the auxiliary engine is mounted very securely in place, so holding this model and swishing it is definitely very easy. You can hear maybe a little rattling, and that's mostly due to the engine details and those stub with bar pieces. Uh, these little sections that you see moving here are supposed to be a little bit loose, and that's just due to the nature of that connection. The shape of the M1 does make it a little awkward to hold, since Grogu's dome is only held in place by friction and not a traditional connection. Um, if you tend to, or if you bump that, it tends to fall off more often than not. Also, unfortunately, Grogu doesn't fit quite right in this little well here. His ears tend to cause a little bit of problem with the dome piece. So, uh, there are ways that you can slightly like angle this and, and kind of stuff him in there. Like if you get him, if you get one of the ears under the edge here, he fits okay. But not a big deal. I showed you earlier those two curved slopes that are only held in place by one stud. I find these coming off all the time. Uh, this is unfortunately kind of where you want to put your fingers if you're holding this, but if you grip it back here, these these two are very solidly in place. There goes the dome again. So I guess if you put your thumb on the dome and you have your fingers underneath in the right place, this is this is very solid. On my model, one of the two dark blue scrape plates that make up the stripe in the front here, uh, these two in the middle are held on with those minifigure rings. And I think my minifigure ring must have been used or something, or the stud doesn't quite hold on like it should um, to the cone underneath there, so that falls off in mine all the time. And while I'm not 100% sold on the tail's appearance, it is very sturdy, and this is a good thing because it bumps your arm all the time when you're trying to hold it. So it's really good that this is not going to come off or get ruined very easily. Even though those engines and bar connections are fairly, fairly shallow ones, these are reasonably secure, and at the same time they're pretty easy to take off and put back on. I've done that a couple times already. So apparently those two bar connections do have a fair bit of uh, clutch strength, so that's really great. The leading edge of the wing, the those tiles here, um, these are actually more secure than you'd think. They are ever so slightly wedged in between the barrel of the cannon here um, and the wedge underneath. So there isn't really much room to move up or down, like this is very solid. And thus the only degree of freedom really is to rotate out like this, and that just doesn't happen very often unless you're doing it on purpose. And of course this tile is also very simple to put back on if it does fall off, because there's only one connection point and it's pretty easy to, to get it back in there. The stand is also very sturdy and holds the fighter securely. There aren't any moving pieces and it's pretty simple to get the fighter on and off.
In conclusion, this is a very fun model to build, and the end result is easily one of the best looking Mandalorian M1s available. The model includes great detailing, it's sturdy enough for light play, and for pricing I was pretty happy with how much I was able to take off of the final build. Again, without any substitutions for the ship and stand, Bricklink's algorithm gave me 6 doors and $99 without shipping and tax, or about $138 with shipping and tax. Substituting out those lightsaber hilts for the Technic connectors and substituting the 29L hose and flat silver, my results changed to 4 stores and $98 without shipping and tax, or about $127 with shipping and tax. And finally, using Pick a Brick in April of 2023, I was able to get all but 9 of the required elements directly from LEGO, and that totaled $64 including tax. This met the thresholds for eliminating the handling fee for both bestseller and standard pieces, and qualified for free shipping. Turning to Bricklink for the remaining elements, I got 3 stores and $7 without shipping and tax, or about $25 total. So the grand total was $89, which is $49 less than if I had just gone with Bricklink without any substitutions. Here's a quick plug to watch my video about Brick Hunter to see how I quickly add parts to my Pick a Brick cart directly from an XML wanted list. Instructions for this model are available on Brick Vault's website for $14.99. There will be a link to where you can purchase the instructions in the description below, and remember you can use the code CATS15 for 15% off. Thanks as always for watching my review of David Buchholz's and Brick Vault's Mandalorian N1. If you built this model, you have something to share that I left out, or have a question about something I didn't cover, please leave your thoughts below in the comments. Remember to leave the video a like, subscribe to the channel, or follow me on Instagram if you haven't already, and I hope to see you back next time.